Hello and welcome to the International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch, where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines, rights lawyers call for ICC probe into war crimes by Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. Thai Prime Minister faces no confidence vote as police crack down on protests. Taliban take over Kabul airport after US withdrawal from Afghanistan. And in our video section, we take a look at the COVID-19 Delta variant and the efficacy of existing vaccines. In our first story, the International Criminal Court has been urged to investigate war crimes committed by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. The British Bar Association of Laws, or Guernica 37, submitted evidence to the court on August 30th. The lawyers represent hundreds of survivors and families of victims in Yemen. The group has asked that the ICC investigate three incidents, including the 2018 Dahyan airstrike. The Saudi-led attack killed 51 people, including 40 children, in a school bus. Guernica 37 has also referred to a missile strike on a funeral home in Sana'a in October 2016. 155 people were killed and over 500 were injured. The coalition later stated that the attack had been based on incorrect information. The third issue is related to the alleged torture and murder of civilians being held in prisons in South Yemen. Since 2015, the Saudi-led coalition has carried out nearly 66,000 airstrikes on Yemen. Almost one-third of these have been non-military targets, including hospitals, schools, etc. The ongoing war has killed around 233,000 people. According to the UN, 5 million people are only one step away from famine. Crucial imports, including food, fuel and medicines, are restricted due to the Saudi air and naval blockade. Guernica 37 has also asked the ICC to investigate coalition members including Jordan, Senegal and the Maldives. It has also asked the court to investigate citizens of Colombia, El Salvador, Panama and Chile. They were hired as mercenaries by a US-based contractor on behalf of the UAE. In our next story, Thai Prime Minister Prayuth chan and Thai Ministers are facing a no-confidence motion in Parliament. The measure was tabled for debate on Tuesday with a vote in the lower house set for September 4th. The debate will cover several issues including the state's pandemic response and corruption. This follows months of protests demanding the Prime Minister's resignation. Rallies were held across at least five provinces on Sunday with caravans of cars and motorcycles. On August 30th, Thailand had recorded 256 deaths and over 115,900 new cases in 24 hours. People are demanding better access to vaccines, government funds for pandemic response, etc. Protesters have also raised a long-standing demand for democratic reforms. These protests have been met with an increasingly violent crackdown by police. Security officials have targeted not only protesters but also journalists and bystanders. Routine use of tear gas, water cannons and rubber bullets has also been reported. Forum Asia and Human Rights Lawyers Alliance have argued that this is unjustifiable under international law. Prachatai reported that at least one protester had been blinded in one eye. A 15-year-old is in critical condition after reportedly being shot with live ammunition. Amnesty has also reported at least two other cases of children with gunshot wounds. The violent protest, crackdown on protests has been accompanied by the arrest of dozens of protest leaders. Between July 2020 and August 2021, at least 800 people have faced criminal charges. According to Thai Lawyers for Human Rights, 374 lawsuits have been filed for joining peaceful protests. The charges include sedition, defamation, royal defamation and violation of emergency provisions. Our next story is from Afghanistan, where the United States officially withdrew its troops on the night of August 30th. This marks an end to the military invasion and occupation of the country after 20 years. The withdrawal was completed in compliance with the deadline set under the Doha Agreement. The Taliban had now taken control of the Tarbul airport. Meanwhile, at least seven Taliban fighters were reportedly killed in the Panjshir province on Monday. Members of local militias announced on Tuesday that fighting had occurred at the valley's western entrance. Thousands of militia fighters and former army and special forces members are present in Panjshir. They are being led by Ahmed Masood, who is the son of Mujahideen commander Ahmed Shah Masood. The Taliban has been in negotiations with Masood and his allies for two weeks. However, as per local reports, phones and internet services to Panjshir have been cut. Tolo News reported that the Taliban had also blocked roads leading to the province. The Taliban has not announced what form the new government will take. There have been concerns about the freedom of press amid several reports of journalists being attacked. Uncertainty also remains about the rights of marginalized groups, including women. Meanwhile, one third of the country's population is facing hunger. The fighting has also displaced over 570,000 Afghans. And for our final story, we take a look at the latest on the COVID-19 pandemic. Concerns have grown surrounding the Delta variant, which is considered highly transmissible. The virus has been detected in at least 132 countries so far. According to the WHO, it has spiked lower global infections by 80% in four weeks. With less than 3% of people vaccinated, deaths surged by 89% in Africa. Emerging studies have also shown that the variant can infect fully vaccinated people. Here is Dr. Satyajit Rath to talk more about the Delta variant and the efficacy of existing vaccines. The broad lesson still remains the following. All the vaccines which are based on last year's strains still provide excellent protection against serious illness and hospital and death for COVID-19. 
I'm not going to say hospitalization because uh, again, the, the uh, criteria for hospitalization vary, but certainly all the vaccines based on last year's strains protect against serious illness and death even by this year's Delta-like strains. What we, so that's promising. What we also know is that the protection against mild illness, infection and transmission provided by the vaccines appears to be lower for this year's Delta-based strains compared to that against last year's strains. Let's keep in mind that protection against transmission is a um, quantitative idea. It's not a yes, no idea. So vaccines brought down the transmission efficiency of last year's strains quite a lot. Vaccines have brought down the transmission efficiency of this year's Delta-based strains, but not by as much as last year's strains. So that's the first thing, which means that Delta will spread more slowly amongst vaccinated people than amongst unvaccinated people, but it will still spread at a reasonably fast rate. That's the first point. The second point is because the increased efficiency of transmission of Delta from person to person is higher based on the fact that the virus can get into cells more efficiently. We can imagine that just as it's easier for the Delta strains to be more transmissible from person to person, they're also more transmissible from cell to cell within the same person. And if that happens, then the likelihood is that the uh, ability of Delta-based strains to cause severe disease is going to be a little bit higher. And that's what everybody is finding. But it's not that therefore Delta is a lethal virus. It's not. It's just that instead of say 10% uh, people becoming severely ill, 15%, 17% people become severely ill. So that's the second point. And that's where Delta is causing increases, but not huge ones in both rates of transmission and, and, and likelihood of causing severe disease. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.